Thank you, Alan. I welcome you to CCIM San Diego's first Lunch and Learn series of 2021. This year, we are going to continue to promote excellence, competency, and collaboration. I'm your host, Doug Tabor, board member of CCIM San Diego and rental realtor with KW Commercial. And I'm always delighted to introduce my co-host, Miss and actually fellow board member, sorry, Paris, Ms. Paris Mo. Paris is a sustainability coordinator at Verdani Partners. How are you today, Paris? I'm doing great, pleasure to be here with you today. Wonderful, and we're grateful to have you back in 2021, Paris, so thank you. Of course, happy we have- back too, and happy new year to everyone. Yes, gosh, happy new year. It seems like the new year was just yesterday, uh, but we had a lot going on already in 2021. Uh, a few housekeeping items to attend to. First, as you probably know, you are in listen-only mode. Uh, you are welcome to chat with each other using the chat box. We are accepting questions. Uh, we have a lot to cover, so the questions will be handled towards the end of the presentation, uh, but use the Q&A box to submit your questions. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and you will receive a shared copy after the event. Uh, and you can also find it on YouTube after the event if you want to share it with others. Uh, our speaker, as you probably heard previously, has a lot of fascinating information to cover today. So again, we will be holding a lot of the Q&A towards the end of the event, but he has told us that he is willing to stay a little bit past noon to answer questions that may come up. Um, so a little bit about CCIM. CCIM stands for Certified Commercial Investment Member. Uh, the CCIM lapel pin denotes that the wearer has completed advanced coursework uh, in real estate economics and investing and demonstrated proven industry experience. Membership in the CCIM Institute is made up of commercial real estate professionals from across the globe. And the San Diego chapter focuses again on events that promote excellence, competency, and collaboration. For more information about becoming a CCIM designee and our upcoming events, Take a moment to visit CCIMSanDiego.com, connect on our LinkedIn page, or subscribe to our YouTube channel. And now if I could, I'd like to just take a moment to thank our generous sponsors for 2021. We're so grateful to have their support. Uh, our platinum sponsors include Chase Commercial Lending, Heck Solberg, Marcus and Milchap, Marsh McLennan Agency, Procopio, and Savills Global Real Estate Experts. Uh, our gold sponsors for the year are CoStar, Exeter 1031 Exchange Services, Lankford & Associates, Pacific Medical Buildings, Slat Capital, and SCS Engineers. Again, we thank all of our sponsors for their continued support. And now I'd like to ask Paris to go ahead and introduce an audience poll. You know a little bit about who we are and now we'd like to take a moment to run a poll and just kind of find out who's in our audience today. So take a moment, please fill out the, the poll. And I always like to say watching these polls is like watching a horse race. Some, some of them are ahead, some of them are behind, but some usually catch up. Uh, looks like we have a lot of owner investors today, 28%. Uh, number of brokers in the audience, 32%. Project managers, attorneys, not sure who the others are. Maybe we should get some more categories, Paris. Yeah. All right. So we're going to wrap up our poll. And today we have a predominant group of owner investors. So we do welcome everybody to these events because, again, they are about excellence and collaboration. So you might have heard a little bit of our discussion before we started, but we are really excited to share uh, the presentation of our speaker today. Uh, Mr. Jim Young is the founder and CEO of Real Tom Con I'm sorry, Realcom Conference Group, an education organization that produces Realcom, IBCon, and CoreTech, the world's leading conferences on technology, automated business solutions, intelligent buildings, and energy efficiency for the commercial and corporate real estate industry. Jim interacts with some of the largest companies globally pertaining to some of the most advanced and progressive next generation real estate projects under development. 
He is at the intersection of commercial and corporate real estate, technology, automation, and innovation. Giving us a view today into the future of commercial real estate, please welcome our speaker, Mr. Jim Young. Jim, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Doug and Paris for, and the CCM San Diego chapter for having me. Um, it's, it's exciting to, to be sharing with my hometown. And as you're gonna see in a couple minutes, my, um, my insight and my perspective on this topic is global. And there are some things going on around the world that um, not a lot of people in, in our country know about, but it is absolutely impacting the commercial and corporate real estate uh, industry buildings in general. And I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to share with your audience. And if, if you've never seen me speak, my style is incredibly informal. Um, I expect mistakes to happen. So if I mess up, I'm not gonna be embarrassed. There is no such thing as a dumb question. And my success, the way I judge my success in these events is based on the level of engagement that I get from the audience. So I'm gonna talk probably pretty fast. I'm gonna cover a lot of material, but please get your, your questions into Paris and Doug and, and we can have them whenever, you know, answer them whenever you see fit. But if I just sit here and talk, um, if I could see you live, you know, and you're, you're just staring at me, one of three things, you know everything I'm talking about um, uh, and you're bored. Um, you know nothing about uh, what I'm talking about and you're scared or somewhere in the middle. So um, I really, I'm here for you and to share information that I've uh, accumulated over the last 25, 30 years and um, hopefully it's valuable. Wonderful. All right, so let me share my screen. Let's make sure this is working. And you just give me a confirmation that you can in fact see my screen. We can see it. Is it large you scale? You can see yep. it? Okay. All right, um, so a uh, little context before we get started. Um, you know, everybody says, Jim, give me your bio. And I say, well, 25, almost 30 years in real estate technology. <clears throat> Many of you may think real estate prop tech, tech is new, it's not. It's actually been going on for about four decades now. I entered um, in the mid 80s at a company called Sperry Van S. So many of you may be uh, familiar with that company. I was their chief innovation officer. So I was a broker and then I was their chief innovation officer and then actually did a lot of business development uh, leading up to the actual creation of their franchise model that was based around technology. And again, that was long, long, long time ago. Started a consulting company out after that, that ran for about three years. And in 1999, started two companies, Realcom, which is the conference, and a company called RE Apps, which was a brokerage automation platform that we eventually sold to LoopNet, which eventually got sold to CoStar. So I've been in this field for a very long time. And then more recently in my, in my Realcom travels, uh, we, we did tours around the world looking for real estate technology. So uh, our first trip was to Asia, and we went Tokyo, Seoul, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Beijing, Kuala Lumpur, and Singapore. It was about a two-week uh, run. We would look at buildings all day, fly all night, do it again. Uh, from there, uh, we went to Europe and looked at uh, pretty much sustainability objectives. Um, it's probably about uh, eight years ago. And then um, most recently, well, actually not most, about eight plus years ago, um, really started paying attention to the Middle East, specifically Dubai and Abu Dhabi. I've stood on top of the tallest buildings in the world, again, looking for technology innovation. I uh, was fortunate enough to have my two daughters with me in Shanghai when we stood atop the Shanghai Tower while it was being built. And then two, three years later, my two young daughters were fortunate enough to go back and get an inside tour when it was completed. So they've actually seen the inside of the building and I haven't. And then uh, have been on the 132nd floor of Burj Khalifa in Dubai, which is the most, um, uh, the highest you can get. Uh, if you don't own a condo or, or some space in that, pro, in that. And again, the idea was to chase big projects globally because they were more adept to spending money and pushing the envelope on innovation. So what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna go through pretty quick and pretty deep where technology is impacting your business. And, and I, I've talked to you know hundreds of thousands of folks on this topic. And basically, if you're sitting there watching this presentation, you're wondering you know, on a scale of one to 10, one being a novice and 10 being the absolute expert, where are you on that journey? Are you a one, are you a two, are you a three? Where's San Diego as a region? And we can actually get into some of this conversation later. 
um, I have the, the context of being able to compare a San Diego to a Los Angeles, to a New York, to a Singapore, to a Shanghai, to Dubai. And, and it's really interesting to see the way real estate is practiced in other parts of the world because of technology. It is changing. And, and, and it just makes you wonder why isn't it changing as fast here in the United States? So my presentation is called The Future of Commercial Real Estate uh, 2021 Trends. A lot of this came from 2020. Um, and uh, it'll give you a little bit of past, uh, but more importantly, what's coming. Okay, so um, the future uh, purpose of space, brick and mortar, boy, if, if, and I, my last slide is COVID related, but if you think about what Amazon has done to the mall, uh, when we work in the, in the work from home model, and now you know, the COVID work from home model is, um, is doing uh, to the question, why do we need to go to a building? So we can sit up with our laptops and do video teleconferencing. We can sit in our, in our beds and watch movies. We don't need to go to movie theaters. We can sit at our kitchen table and buy things. We don't have to go to, on Amazon. So all of the things uh, that we used to have to go to a place, and this, this transaction has been going on for 25 years, maybe even longer, but COVID really accelerated it. So what I think you are gonna begin to see an acceleration of something that's been going on for a long time is radical adaptive reuse. Um, we see malls being turned into distribution centers. We see malls being turned into corporate headquarters. We see office building being, office buildings being turned into apartment buildings. Um, if, if you don't have to nail down a wall, don't. Um, and because that wall is gonna move, that, flat, that space is gonna have to be like a transformer where it changes. And, and most importantly, you have to make very good decisions on what technology you put into that very flexible space to bring a new enhanced experience to the people who are driving an hour to get into work. Because if you don't give them anything special, when they get to the office building, when they get to the mall, they're gonna stay in their houses with their laptops and forgo that hour commute on the five or that two hour commute on a train in New York. All right, uh, space is a service, co-working, flex space. We kind of already talked about this on the first slide, but you know, everybody says, wow, WeWork failed, you know, went from zero to 51 billion and then kind of collapsed. It's kind of trying to rebuild itself. Just because the business model of WeWork was a little failed and they had some management issues, the, the idea is not failed, okay? But what, the, what COVID has done is it taught us, you know, do we have to go to that traditional office with all my coworkers? Or if I don't have a corporate headquarters in my town, do I go share space with hundreds of people I don't know from different companies? Or do I work from home? And so what I think you're gonna see is the, the WeWork model, especially coming out of COVID, is going to radically change. We're going to end up working in airports, malls, um, buses, planes, homes, more than we ever did. You're going to see the video conference experience that we're doing right now get even better. You're going to see people equipping their home offices with more and more technology, sometimes better than the office, which is going to put a lot of pressure on getting people back to the office if the technology at home is even better. So uh, flex space co-working is not dead. It's taken a little hibernation because of COVID um, and, and the difficulty of getting people back into dense areas. But, uh, but coming out of COVID, I think you're gonna see yet another iteration of co-working and flex space uh, that most of you have not seen. Um, a digitally enhanced occupant experience. So prior to COVID, what this meant was uh, you walk into a building, you have a phone and the phone knows you're there and the phone allows you to order your coffee, it allows you to schedule your yoga uh, in some of the most sophisticated buildings in the world, it allows you to call the elevator um, as you're going up the elevator, you tell your office you're there, it reconfigures your office, it gets you a seat and, the, and, and, and basically takes control of the building from your cell phone. And I would say that at RealCom 2019 in Nashville, enhanced occupant experience via cell phone was the trending app of that moment. Uh, you know, things change every couple of years, but in 2019, that was a big deal. And I think what you're gonna see coming out of it is going to be, um, we're already seeing in New York, RxR is using the cell phone for uh, contact tracing, meaning people coming into the building you know, with COVID potential exposure, being able to trace. It's already brought up a whole bunch of privacy issues about you know, what does that mean from a privacy standpoint and a traceability standpoint. As you all know or may not, Google and Apple downloaded contact tracing software into the operating system about four months ago. For those of you who've got 11s and 12s and even some newer models, you can now go and see the health uh, screening um, uh, button on there. You're gonna see a lot more of this and there's gonna be a lot of debate um, on, on the, uh, the discussion on um, health and safety versus privacy. 
but digital enhanced experience um, is no going nowhere. And I think you're gonna see some new ways of working with coworkers, some new technologies that bring people from far away into your offices in ways never imagined. I think Disney uh, you know, kind of experiences and uh, we've seen them, uh, we're working with them and they're just not mainstream yet, but uh, come into an office building mall near you. Okay, uh, real estate companies, digital transformation. This is kind of one of those wonky, ambiguous topics. And uh, I'll try to really net it out. Uh, if you're still carrying around paper and, and a pad, and if you can't access your files from anywhere, and if you're not using you know, advanced analytics to, to look at market data, and, and if you're still getting you know, commission checks in an envelope, um, or if you're still you know, printing ESCO, re ESCO reports, or if you're not, you know, if you haven't moved all of your organization out of metal file cabinets into the cloud, that was step one. Step two is getting them out of document type formats and more into integrated applications like databases. And so if you're still, you know, there's three steps to digital transformation. There's the paper that we all grew up with. Step one is just getting them scanned up to a file server someplace or the cloud that I can get to them. But the third is really knowing your whole business is up online and has started to be rethought, uh, reorganized pulled out of the documents, out of the spreadsheets, out of the PowerPoints and put into complex information systems that manage your business. And, and if that's a little confusing to you, that's probably a sign you need to pay some attention to this because I've seen the best systems in the world. I've seen the processes been flat, the efficiency improved and the effectiveness in the market is significantly enhanced. And, and if you don't jump on your, your business practices um, in the near future are frankly just gonna look outdated. All right, uh, here's, that's a good lead into this slide, the enterprise architecture, you know, as the foundation. This is where it gets techy, right? And this is where you know, the world that I live in. And if you're a CEO or a COO, a CFO, you're probably gonna understand this at a conceptual level, but you're not gonna be down in the weeds. The person who's down in the weeds is your chief information officer, your chief digital officer, your chief technology officer. Those are the people who buy the RD MRI systems. Those are the people who evaluate the VTS systems. Those are the people who are looking at putting smart systems into the buildings. And more and more, this enterprise architecture is moving from just um, you know, the property management, you know, printing an invoice, collecting some rent, to connecting the building to the enterprise. So you have 10 buildings in your portfolio, you go to 123 Main or, or, or the uh, uh, One America Plaza building in downtown San Diego, you have all the financial information, you have all the tenant information. Oh, and guess what? The building is also connected in. So you know what the energy usage is, you know what lights are on, you know what doors are open. So those physical side of the building um, maintenance, management, operations, facilities is also now being integrated into the enterprise architecture. And basically what that means is flattening operational costs and increasing your, trans your, your, your ability to look into the data and manage the portfolio more like a space station mission rather than running around, you know, just uh, chopping it wood, if you would. Um, all right, IT, OT, IOT convergence. Um, this, um, if you're not technical, you know, obviously you know what IT is. OT is a new term for about the last three years. OT stands for operational technology. That's kind of the, the, the phrase that the facility managers, the management, the maintenance people gave to it. It means those Johnson control, HVAC, lighting, doors, um, that we used to just call them engineering systems, uh, but now they've kind of got the term OT. IOT is what you're probably familiar with is on the consumer side, meaning your watches uh, that have you know, your Fitbits or your alarm clock that's connected to the internet or, or your lighting system that you bought um, you know, at, at, at Home Depot that can talk to your phone, which can talk to the internet, that's IOT. Automobiles will be part of IOT. Um, drones will be part of IoT, Internet of Things, everything else being connected to the Internet. Well, you talk about complexity. You know, imagine what happens when somebody walks into your building with an IoT device that is connected to your network because one of your tenants is uh, has a health system that they they help their their employees monitor their health, and the employee is sitting in a common lunch area, and somebody hacks their lot their watch, goes through their watch into your network and gets into your system. And if you don't pay attention to cybersecurity, I would encourage those executives that run companies to pay attention. Uh, there has been critical hacks in the last two, three weeks uh, that have affected 18,000 government and, and Fortune 100 companies that they're still two weeks later trying to get to the under, understand fully what happened. They haven't discovered all the code. Some of it was not even turned on yet, meaning it was buried inside systems waiting to happen. So it's important to understand the difference between IT, OT, and IoT. 
have somebody on your team that knows how to integrate those for the good things, but also knows how to keep an eye on the bad guys uh, for the bad things. All right, um, understanding the investment landscape process, well, um, uh, understanding the investment landscape. So, you know, for those of you who you know, tune into this topic once in a while, I'm sure you've heard of PropTech. PropTech is, you know, the name that's been given to all the new investing that's been taking place over the last 11, 12 years now, since 2008, after the crash, everybody came back with a vengeance with a lot of capital, interest rates were at zero, and billions and billions and billions of dollars have been invested in prop tech, some good and some not so good. So, so what you have is a lot of money, a lot of ideas, but in a lot of cases, not a lot of governance. So there are still, there are now companies who've been startups for two, three, four, five, seven years are on their fourth, fifth round of financing and have still not produced an adequate user base or any kind of sustainable cash flow. So my message on PropTech is if you're the person in your company, you have to have an incredibly tight protocol to understand what you're looking for and why. And the company that you're looking at, who the competitors are, you have to have a competitive landscape map. And if you think this is the only company that's ever done this, all you need to do is a quick Google search or come to a RealCom event to know that for every process such as 360 photography, you know, inside your suite to take a picture of a, of a piece of real estate, there's probably seven or eight vendors now. And Digital Twins has gotten a lot of, of action in the last uh, 12 to 18 months. I think there's close to 50 plus now digital, quin, quin, uh, digital twin companies. So you're gonna have to have your pencil really sharp and understand what you're looking for and have a very rigorous routine and procedure to contrast and compare all these different solutions against each other. The last thing you wanna do is buy the first solution that runs in your door screaming, they're gonna change your business for good. Pretty good chance you're gonna be left behind uh, with a product that won't integrate into anything. Company may not survive the next couple of years as this thing tightens up. Uh, and it's really important that you, you do the best you can to make sure you understand uh, who you're investing in or, or who, what product you're buying. Okay. Um, the real estate um, cybersecurity threat. I touched upon this a little bit. I'm not going to go too deep into this because it requires people who really know what they're doing. These threats, the one that recently came out in the last couple of weeks, um, the people who ultimately discovered it, the reason they discovered it is because the, the, the malware code was written so much better than the existing code that it stood out. Okay, that's a little scary. Let's say, for example, you buy ABC real estate information system and, and their system gets embedded with this malware. And then all of a sudden somebody discovers and they say, you know, the code of your software provider will give them a C plus, but this malware was an A plus. What this tells you are the bad guys are getting smarter and they're coming after our businesses every single day. You will be impacted at a personal level, at a company level, at an industry level. And as you, we saw two weeks ago at a national level, and that goes from a disgruntled employee making life miserable for your company, all the way to a nation state who is looking to take down a country. So if you don't have anybody on your team that uh, understands cybersecurity, I was a co-founder and still a board member of an organization called the Real Estate Cyber Consortium. It's a group of top-notch real estate organizations that focus on cybersecurity and um, are really determined to get out in front of this so people who don't have the skills nor the resources will have an organization that will do the heavy lifting and then, uh, and then they can um, share that information with people with less experience. All right, um, this, this one is probably the word and phrase you have heard forever. Um, I'll give you a little story on big data. Uh, the year is 1987-ish. Uh, I'm a broker at Sperry Van Ness in San Diego at the uh, Aventine, first floor. I think JLL's there now. I sat in the corner, I was a new broker and they handed me uh, my boss at the time, I don't know if you guys remember Jim Barone, or uh, um, uh, Roger Grove, those are the two guys who ran our office. They said, Jim, you wanna be in apartments, here's the apartment book. And they handed me a, um, a yellow book and said, just start calling people, cold call them, come back in three months after you experience that and we'll teach you the next steps. So I did and I you know, started making my calls and my first call was ABC Real Estate. And I said, you wanna buy, you wanna sell? And they said, no, thank you, I hung up. About five calls later, I talked to a EFG Real Estate and I said, do you want to buy, you want to sell? He says, Jim, you just called. And I said, no, I, I called ABC and DEF, you're, you know, HIJ. And he goes, Jim, obviously you're new to the industry. And you don't know how this works. We're a partnership. We hold a lot of different properties under different names. 
And, uh, and you know, I'm, we're not selling any of them. Well, that was too much pain for me. I said, I'm getting to the bottom of this. I went to the San Diego County Recorder Office, downloaded the entire uh, database of commercial properties. And I grouped and sort, and, and I, I, the key indicator was, um, I said, how do, how do I know that we're all these properties, who, who owns all these properties? The key variable was they all mailed their tax returns to the same address. So now all I had to do was do a query on 123 Silverado, up came every asset associated with that address. My next call was a little more knowledgeable. Hey, Bob, I see you've got 23 assets. You've been acquiring them and not selling much over the last 20 years. 17 of your first assets were in downtown San Diego, but I realized I noticed your last three acquisitions were in North County. Are you moving your portfolio north? And he goes, who are you? And how did you know all this about me? That took me about two days to come up with. From there, I designed and developed the um, uh, notice of default system that put Sperry Venice on the map. Uh, we were 18 months, or actually 12 to 16 months ahead of that. When it finally hit, it was like shooting fish in a barrel. We had an information system that would pull NODs from the county recorder office into our system, organize them by sector, by size, by broker. And within 24 hours, it was a lead sheet uh, on that broker's desk that could, you know, he could be calling the broker or the owner for a deal. That was 25 plus years ago. So you can just imagine where big data analytics and AI are today. They're applying algorithms and machine learning to watch how markets shift and valuations and, and, and why is San Diego market going up and, and Chicago's going down. And, and it's not just anecdotal, it's all driven by data. So if you don't have somebody on your team that specializes in data analytics, um, machine learning, or, or now the, the buzzword is AI, I haven't seen too many people really apply what is true AI to our industry yet, but it's getting closer and closer every day. So, um, and I'm hoping we get some questions on this one because this is the cornerstone of real estate in the future, I, I think is big data. Okay, uh, for those of you who, you know, walk into a building and Wi-Fi is hard to get onto and your cell phones don't work. That is unacceptable in the 21st century. I've been in some of the best buildings on the planet uh, within the last, well, let's say pre-COVID. And, you know, they, they boast of beautiful marble and 100 stories, but my cell phone doesn't work. Well, that is no longer acceptable. Um, clients, tenants, especially with this COVID mobility push, are now going to be asking landlords to demonstrate strong mobile communications capabilities inside buildings. And that ranges from, from not just Wi-Fi, but into this new iteration of 5G and CBRS. Everything you've been hearing about on television and commercials is about 5G consumer. San Diego is usually one of the first cities in the country to, to play around with that because we're considered a progressive technical city. But you don't have any idea, I don't think, unless you're a pilot project, on what 5G for buildings means, and more specifically, CBRS. You are going to be um, putting new radios inside the building, slapping them on walls just to make sure 5G consumer works, but also private LTE networks, meaning your building or the tenant inside your building could have their own phone network that allows them privacy and robust communications and then walk out the door, it switches to the public network. All the IoT devices from security cameras to HVAC to doorbells to, to access control um, are all gonna be using some type of wireless communication uh, to, to connect the building to the network. Now, along with that comes a whole bunch of privacy concerns, a whole bunch of cybersecurity concerns, but this 5G movement is out of the bag. In fact, in China, they just launched a 6G test satellite, which means we're just barely getting into 5G at a consumer level, haven't even begun to understand what it means at a commercial level, and China is now launching satellites on 6G, probably putting them anywhere from seven to eight years ahead of us in some of the ideas and the applications for the tech. So if you don't understand what 5G CBRS or in-building wireless means and either you're an owner occupier trying to boost the value of your property or you're um, an engineer or part of the operations team, it's not it's something you cannot afford to, uh, to ignore. All right, um, augmented robotics, blockchain. Um, I am just totally amazed every single day on what's coming out. And it's still kind of in the lab settings. And because I looked for it, I'm, I know about it. But, you know, in Dubai, they've been playing around with uh, drone motorcycles for policemen, meaning the policemen um, are driving drones. Uh, General Motors just announced a prototype yesterday or the day before um, about the first single person uh, drone for humans. OK, um, and, and this stuff is getting more and more real. Now, is it mainstream? No. Um, FedEx and, and I forgot the other person. 
is starting to drop packages as rural uh, neighborhoods or nursing homes. They forgot the application, but they're really starting to work on delivering packages versus drones. Will the day come when pizzas are being delivered by drones? I imagine they will. Um, Singapore has got an incredible uh, drone program that they use for aerial surveillance, for uh, road maintenance and utilities. Um, again, in some cases, way ahead of what we're seeing in the United States. So if, if we think we can afford to wait, um, we can't just look in context of the United States. We've got to look at context of the globe um, and number one, figure out all these new advanced applications, but number two, understand the privacy and the cyber security threats that are going to come along with them. Um, blockchain, you're seeing you know, uh, the cryptocurrencies, I think at ridiculous prices, it's still an unproven technology. Janet Yellen just you know, said she's still doubtful. Most of the, the um, cryptocurrency applications are still used for criminal type procedures. But I think I did see something where somebody just bought a major uh, piece of real estate and actually paid with it with, with blockchain, or with um, block, not blockchain, I forgot the name of the currency. But um, uh, anyways, these technologies um, that you think are kind of far ranging um, are not as far away as you think. And I'll give you one more example. Think about the retail supply chain. Let's say you own retail, you own a mall, you're leasing all these retail tenants. Right now, Amazon's kind of disintermediating the physical. Well, guess what is on the horizon? Could be five, 10 years, but it's coming. Who's gonna disrupt Amazon and the idea of having delivery trucks, delivery trucks coming around to your house to deliver a toothbrush is 3D printing. And it won't be too long, you know, too long, five, 10 years, before every household will have a 3D printer multi-material, meaning it can use rubber, plastic, all sorts of different ingredients, and can literally build um, in, uh, items from scratch in the home uh, instead of having to go to the store to, store to buy them. The, the, the show that I look forward to, or the industry I'm paying a lot of attention to these days, is the 3D, 3D printing. I think there's a lot of opportunities not just to use them, there's some great investment opportunities for companies who are on the forefront. All right, um, along with the good comes some bad. Um, our engineering schools are, are not doing well from an enrollment standpoint. K through 12 math in this country has been on decline for at least 10 years. Um, what COVID is doing to our school systems right now is decimating something that was already a problem. And if you don't believe me, just go math and science scores the global and just look at the chart over the last five, 10 years, you'll see the US has just been consistently going down. I was so um, uh, upset about this, and I still am, that uh, probably eight years ago, I started an organization in San Diego called the Youth Space Institute. And this was designed for young kids, uh, predominantly high school kids, and or initially predominantly women, um, uh, young girls, to put experiments on the International Space Station. And I actually have one in my desk. This is what you call a micro lab. This little guy traveled around the earth for 30 days. It's probably got 15, 20 million miles on it. I'm not sure how many people can hold something in their hand. It's traveled 15, 20 million miles. But, um, and this was um, uh, the team of girls that actually uh, did it. But my point here is every single person on this webinar, whether you have kids, grandkids or not, you have a responsibility to make sure this next generation has the skill set to compete globally. As of this moment, in my humble opinion, we do not have that ability. And if we don't reverse course and get our kids in pre you know, one through six, junior high, high school, on through college, capable of dealing with these complex physics, chemistry, uh, geometry uh, problems, then we will see our big tech industries go the way of other countries and we will lose all those benefits that come along with being a leading edge company or country, I should say. So, um, and what does this mean for a building owner? Well, when you get this nice new building and it's got all this new technology and something breaks, you're gonna have trouble finding people to fix it. And therefore you're gonna be forced to manage your buildings in the old way and ultimately you're gonna become less competitive. So this is a problem, not just from a personal level, but from an industry level. I uh, work very closely with IFMA, International Facilities Managers Association, BOMA, Building Owners and Managers Association, um, on, on trying to come up with ways to get youth educated on technology and then funnel them into the real estate technology industry. Okay, um, this is in my opinion, the topic for the 21st century. Uh, we are going to be pressured in the next 12, 18, 24 months, civil liberties will be called. Uh, in this particular case with COVID, it will be wellness versus privacy. We are already seeing it. 
The bad side of a lot of the smart building technology and everything is there will be microphones, sensors, cameras connected to networks everywhere. Those input devices are connected to complex networks with wireless and integrated information systems. From there, they go to big databases. From there, that's where the artificial intelligence and the analytics gets applied against them. And there's algorithms that can literally um, you know, um, determine you know, what kind of a person you are. And if um, we as normal citizens, not just tech specialists, if we as, as average citizens don't understand the technology to a certain level, you will be snowballed. And I, I, I'll give you a test right now, pick up your Apple phone, go to privacy settings, microphone. I did this at breakfast uh, the other day to a friend, a relatively tech savvy, He's had an iPhone forever. Uh, some would call them a social influencer. And when they got to that screen, there was about 12 buttons all turned on. And they looked at me and they said, what does this mean? I go, well, every single one of these applications, you've granted them app, uh, access to your microphone, not just when you're using the application, if you read the terms of service, but many of these organizations are allowed, allowed to turn your microphone on even when you're uh, not using their app. So um, Uber has the right to listen to, to you as you leave the car and go into your house. And, and every terms of service is a little different, but I would encourage you to become aware and then, and then at least make the decision. It's okay or it's not. But to walk around with a microphone in your pocket where you don't know who's listening is absurd. And I actually have a friend who has a friend who his number one job, he's an engineer, is to make microphones that can be heard while the phone is in your pocket. So you need to take privacy serious. And if you don't, we will lose it. No other discussion uh, there. Um, and, and I'm hoping we get some questions on this from the audience. Okay, the growing prowess of China tech. Many companies that you, you may have heard of Alibaba, Huawei's been in the news a little bit, Hikvision, maybe Tencent, I don't know if you know. Um, China has, is growing companies much like our Googles and our Facebooks and our Cisco's and all the companies that we've all come to know and buy products from. They're growing these companies at a rate never before seen in modern history. In fact, Jack Ma and, um, and Financial uh, was getting ready to do a big IPO, the largest in the world, uh, out of town, Shanghai and Hong Kong, not New York. Um, and uh, for some reason, it was stopped by the Chinese uh, government. I'm still trying to figure out what, what the reasoning was there. But the bottom line is um, the U.S. is going to see competition in the tech space like never before. Some of my closest friends who follow this at an international level say that China is at least five, potentially seven years ahead on networking, 5G, 6G, artificial intelligence, facial recognition, security surveillance. And um, what does that mean? Well, the, the U.S. for a long time was the provider of technology to the globe. It gave us a, a very good opportunity and a, and a great lifestyle as a result. And if we lose that position, um, we will see our lifestyle probably be impacted, not necessarily us, but children and grandchildren, absolutely. So I would encourage you to um, you know, become more aware and, and understand what the US is up against as far as maintaining its position uh, competitively with technology um, uh, for the next five to 10 years. Okay, and this is the slide uh, that I added um, in the last couple of days uh, uh, because obviously the impact that COVID's had on our world. So I don't need to explain how it's changed everything. Although um, the whole world got an experiment on working from home, we're never gonna go back into the office the same. So your home office situation, technical architecture is gonna need to be different. And I don't just mean a good you know, modem and a, and, a, and, a, and a laptop. I mean, designated space, multiple screens, screens the size of walls, uh, 3D teleportation, three-dimensional uh, vision systems. Uh, your home office is gonna look like the deck of the Starship Enterprise. This also means that the building, how can we get into a building? Are we gonna be expected to show a QR code? Uh, what does contract, contact tracing really mean? Um, COVID is going to change more in, in 24 months than any company organization has done in prop tech in the last 30 years. So if you don't pay attention to COVID as it relates to how it's changing business models, i.e. how we live, work, play, and how that impacts um, uh, how we use the real estate, then you will surely be left behind. And I wrote a document in 1992 that if anybody's interested, I can get it to you, called the information age and the potential impacts on how it uh, will change commercial real estate. So that document is almost 30 years old now. And some of the things I predicted was the demise of 
uh, Blockbuster and the rise of Spotify um, and, and those types of things. And I joke that it took you know, me a career, 30 years, COVID accomplished more in 12 months than I did in 30 years because it forced change. We, we encouraged change, COVID forced it. If you're not paying attention to this, um, depending upon where, you, if you're early part of your career, you will lose opportunities. At the end of part of your career, you may not care, but if you're interested in, in understanding what this means going forward for yourself, kids and grandchildren, you've got to pay attention. We have multiple webinars on this. Current, we've got stuff on YouTube that we recorded. Uh, we've got you know mountains and mountains of good content on this topic that we've done over the last uh, nine months that uh, is up there and free and uh, available to anybody interested. Um, all right, last slide. Um, everybody's going to the cloud. This is probably a little bit too far out there, but I'm gonna say it anyways, you know, for 18, 19 years, we've promoted the cloud as an opportunity. Um, I started a cloud software uh, company in 1999. I'm kind of clouded out and um, I'm starting to see early signs that it's going to be shifting out of the cloud back to distributed. I'm not the only person saying this. This guy here, George Gilder, is a known futurist. Uh, why don't you listen to what he has to say and then we're going to wrap it up. Our guest today published a book about the future of technology called Life After Television. Quote, the computer of the future will be as portable as your watch and as personal as your wallet. It will recognize speech and navigate streets, collect your mail and your news." Close quote. Our guest is worth listening to today, in other words, in large measure because he got so much right back then. And I, th I think that uh, this cloud computing, which was, which was a great triumph for its time and dominated its time, is now reaching the end of the line. The cryptocosm is, refers to this amazing providential efflorescence of creativity that's erupted all around the world to supply a new architecture for the internet and indeed ultimately a new architecture for the entire world economy. All right, so you know, if you're a property management company looking for a new property management or leasing system, that's not relevant. This is way out there. But if there's anybody on the phone who you know, does strategic IT and is trying to guide companies three, five you know, year IT plans, you probably won't take any action on this, but you need to pay attention. Uh, it's early stages, just like when we built a cloud company in 99, it was very early. It took probably five, seven years for it to even you know, reach a, a, a basic group of people. And then all of a sudden it becomes the way of life. So with that, Doug, I am done. And hopefully we've got some questions um, and I can address and, and and uh, clear up any confusion that I may have caused. Yes, we do have some questions. Harris, would you like to go ahead and present our questions today? Yes, sure. Um, I think everyone is probably still digesting all the information shared in the presentation, um, but we do have one question from the audience. It asks, what type of databases do you recommend for storing various types of real estate information? Okay, so that's... Um, that's a, a question that can probably be answered three different ways, but I'll, I'll, start, I'll start with a, a basic fundamental response. My first question is what data, you know, is it is data from a single source, uh, i.e. Uh, view the space data, okay? Um, is it uh, multiple um, repositories of data, internal data that the company has in a database, data that it's got in spreadsheets, data that it's pulling in from the outside? Do they want to combine all this data uh, so they can have you know, one uh, version of the truth, if you will? Um, that's what we call data aggregation. And in that kind of environment, you would need a dashboard. So for example, you would have the address of the asset, you would have all the tenants listed, you would see the status of all the rents collected for that month, you would see the status of the electrical usage, you would see the um, status of the doors that are locked, uh, and the HVA systems that are running their fans. Um, so it, to answer that question specifically, maybe if you get that person's name and they can send me an email, um, I, don't under, I don't know if they mean just one database or multiple databases. And depending upon where you are in the journey, I could give you a very simple answer or a very complex answer. Um, we'll have uh, Mr. Jim Young's email sent to everyone 
post participation of the webinar. So feel free to get in touch with him um, to have more detailed conversation. So this next question asked, where and how do you think AI will first be used in companies' accounting? Good question. Um, so about seven years ago, we saw the first instance of a multifamily organization um, use, not AI yet, because that really hadn't been out back then. It was more, we'll call advanced analytics, just getting your data very well organized uh, and available on a real-time basis. So um, what they did was they changed, they had a lot of apartment units, thousands and thousands of apartments. And just like when you go to the airlines, you know, and you buy a ticket, if there's high demand, your price is high. If there's low demand, your price is lower, right? It's called on-demand pricing. And it's, it's, it's used in more volatile pricing markets. Think about scalped pricing tickets or when you go to buy concert tickets, right? And, and all the iterations of resale that take place and how that impacts the price. Well, they, they attempted to experiment with uh, real-time pricing for apartments. And so it required not necessarily artificial intelligence, but some pretty complex algorithms that said, okay, how many units do we have? How many are rented? How many are on the market? What's the average price? How many people are you know, answering the ads, filling out the applications? What kind of a pipeline do we have? And literally based upon that, you could see the rents change, not in a real-time basis, but daily, you know, as opposed to every quarter or every year review. Um, I actually have not followed up on, on that, so I don't know how it went. So that, that's one thing we've seen already. How will AI uh, be used in the future? I'll give you an, a perfect example, and, and this is going to be controversial, what I'm about to say. For 15 years, we've always wondered, what is the real utilization of my building? Okay, I got a skyscraper. Let's use One America Plaza, downtown San Diego. Looks nice. It's six, seven o'clock at night. I see some lights on at night, so there's people in there. But I don't really know what the, I know what the occupancy is. I know what the rental is, but I don't really know how much people are using it, right? My tenant says I need 15,000 square feet. I got X number of employees. But what my tenant doesn't tell me is 75% of their employees are salespeople or on the road traveling. They only come into the office once a month. I got consultants who travel to client sites. You know, and, and I don't know how much that space is being used. So about seven years ago at our core tech event at the Microsoft campus in Redmond, I asked the question to all these corporate real estate executives. I said, what is the utilization rate of your space? And this was the first time in my career that they were actually willing to share that information. And you know, in the old days, if you went to a Cornet global meeting and you got a corporate real estate person, they would take you into a room, lock the door, make you sign a pledge not to say anything. And they would whisper, I think my utilization rate is 70, 75%, meaning that 25% of the space was being unused. So with that, um, at our event seven years ago, it was the first time in public I asked the question. And I said, raise your hands if your utilization rate is at 80%, 75%, 70%. Do you two want to guess where the number ended up? Doug, you're on mute. 65. 35 to 40% was, was the actual space that they used. So from that point forward in the last years, at our conferences and everybody in our community, we figure out how do we get to the bottom of this? Do we put sensors under the seat? Do we look at logins? Do we have cameras watching people walking through the door? You know, uh, do we use spatial or uh, LIDAR technology to watch the space? So literally, and there's no one answer right now, we still to this day don't know before COVID, and it's even worse with COVID, what the utilization rate is. So for example, Salesforce Tower uh, is rumored to be at about seven to 10% utilization right now. So that big, beautiful new building in San Francisco is at seven to 10%. Not occupancy, because the leases are signed and people are paying their rent, but utilization. So the question is, how is it going to be used in accounting? I think I think one of the first place AI is gonna be used is once we get these buildings censored and we already know the answer. I already know it's 35 to 45%. But if you wanna spend all the money on the sensors and, and the analytics to prove it. But I think the first place that, that this advanced analytics AI is gonna be used is to quantify very scientifically that our buildings are massively underutilized. And, and I'll, I'll pivot to retail. Go to a retail mall the second, third week of January after Christmas, 
at 11 o'clock on a Tuesday morning. There's nobody there, okay? So we build these malls for the Christmas rush, for the holidays with moderate travel through the week, being threatened, challenged by the likes of Amazon for a new retail delivery model. And yet we don't and can't quantify to the minute how much that space is utilized. That's where I think the marketplace is gonna go first. The problem is the owner operators are a little scary to go there because it's gonna tell them what they already know. And then what does that do to valuations and, and, and resale value? And, but I think utilization is gonna become a topic, a big topic over the next 12 to 24 months. So hopefully that answered the question. All right. Um, this next question comes from an audience who's 18 years old and just getting into real estate. And um, he would like to ask you, what are some things you recommend that you should really pay attention to in order to prepare for a future career? Well, the good news is I've got a personal um, a, a, a relationship with this person in that I have a daughter who's 19, one year older, and is very interested in real estate. And I had this conversation with her yesterday. So it's, it's very timely and it's very pertinent. Um, she's doing a little project for me. She goes to school at the USC and she's in the business school, but she's kind of got an interest in real estate. And so um, I, she said, dad, I need a job. Um, I know there's no jobs out there right now. And I go, I've always got projects going on. So I said, I'm gonna give her one that she can relate to, she would like. So we're doing some property searches and she's had her first access to MLSs and she goes, you know, and, and I've been on this journey for 30 years. So to hear her ask this question was kind of funny. You know, why is the data all over the place? I mean, there's, it's, it's in Zillow, it's in LoopNet, it's, it's in private MLS. It's, you know, can I get all this information? And I go, you would think so, wouldn't you? So now she's chasing around all these different systems, putting information into the singular database, going back to the earlier question. So we can get a handle on, you know, I'm analyzing different markets, a particular product type. Um, and I'm pretty picky when it comes to my data analytics, but the answer to your question is at 18 years old, data, data, data. And in case you didn't hear that data, okay? If you master data, just like when I walked into Mark Van Ness's office 30 years ago, after being with the company for three months, maybe six, I said to him, your market is about to collapse. And he said, who are you? And I said, I gave my name and he goes, how long you been with us? And I go, oh, three, six months. And he goes, what are you doing? You know nothing about our business. And I looked him square in the eye, Mark Van Ness and Rand Sperry. And I said, guys, I may not know a lot about the real estate industry, but I know a ton about data. And I threw my report on the stage, a little on their desk, a little indignant, a little annoyed that they, they challenged me like that. And Mark picked up the report and said, well, hold on, hold on. What's this? And I said, that's the notice of, uh, for, uh, notice of default foreclosure list from the uh, County of San Diego, aggregated by address, by institution, um, CalFed, I, and I forgot the names of the banks. These are the ones that are gonna go first. And we were so good that we actually went into the portfolio and could tell which asset was gonna fail first because uh, we were interested in acquiring those assets. We had that foreclosure market in the early 90s so wired and, and knew 12 months ahead of anybody else what was gonna happen because we understood the data. It is the most underutilized part of the real estate industry. Everybody reads the information one page at a time, you know, or a little report. They don't know how to go into query, group, sort, get the data, get it all together, query it, group it, sort it, analyze it. Uh, you can use a pivot table in Excel if you don't know databases. Become an expert on data and, and the ability to juxtapose various data sets against each other and you will either make yourself a billion dollars or make a lot of other people a lot of money. Great. Um, following up uh, closely to the topic of data, one of our audience is very concerned about privacy and um, he asks, what should be done to guard the privacy of his business and those whom he serves? Well, a broker and a property manager. Okay. so. Um, I don't know the person's age. Uh, and the reason I ask, I'm just wondering if they have children. So this is th this, the answer to this question is both at a business level as a property manager and as a possibly a mom, um, you know, as, as well as her own personal life. Too many people, and I'll pick on millennials and young kids for a minute. Too many people just blow off privacy as something that doesn't matter. 
I have nothing to hide, therefore I don't need to worry. Well, when, when everything you do is tracked from how fast you drive and how fast you take the turn and how fast you break and what food you, you eat and, and all the different things. And in China right now, there's something called a social credit scoring system, okay, which, which aggregates data on your daily activities and gives you a credit score. So for example, if you go to uh, have a, a couple of beers with your friends and you drink too many beers, your social credit score goes down. You're not allowed to go to the movie an hour later because the movie has requirements. Now that's, I don't know if that one actually exists. It's just an example I use because people can understand that, but, but collect ownership of your data. And this is an art, this is something that's going on right now in this country. And I suspect in the next 12 to 18 months is going to get out of control in a good way because people are gonna be talking about it. And the test I would ask people to take is go to your Apple phone. I don't know how to do it on, on, a, on a Google uh, operating system, but go to settings, privacy microphone, as I suggested early. And if you've got all your, these applications with your microphone on and you did not know about that, that's your fault. This is where some personal responsibility comes in. As much as the, the, the regulators and the companies are there to, to, to make good decisions as individuals, we are expected to know where are the places that our privacy could be breached. So I've been a smart building advocate for 30 years, put in all the technology, let's use less energy, let's have a better occupant experience, let's only send somebody out to the property once to fix the light bulb instead of four times. There are a million reasons to install all the systems and buildings that make it a better real estate portfolio. However, if you're gonna start using that, that technology for surveillance, microphones, you know, in the light bulbs or cameras in the flower beds or, or you know, and, and, and this is happening in San Diego as we speak, GE just installed street lights in GE with microphones for the purpose of gunshot recognition. Well, guess what? That's one thing they can recognize. I think it's time for citizens of San Diego to ask San Diego, can you, un can you hear a conversation of me and my girlfriend walking down the street? You know, and, and, and if you're okay with that, that's fine. But ignorance is not an option. As citizens, we need to be aware of what's being done then make decisions for ourselves whether or not we're okay with it. And if we're not, then we got to stand up. Hopefully that answered the question. Great advice, by the way, Jim. If, if you're an Android user like me, you're, you go to Privacy Permission Manager and then to Microphones. I know what I'll be doing for the 20 minutes <laughs> after the event today. Paris, what other questions do we have for Jim? He's, he's, he's given us so much amazing yeah. information and he did agree to uh, go a little past Whatever one o'clock. So... Uh, what else do we have for them? And I'll, I'll make Quite this offer too. More. I'll make this offer too. If, if you want to come back at another time uh, with a Zoom call where you let everybody come on, you know, the, on camera, less, much less structured, just like a, a 30 minute, you know, let's have a cup of coffee where we can just talk and, and I can see the people and answer their questions in a much more ad lib. I'm here for you. I'll, I'll, I'd be more than glad to do that. Um, and it's a little better when I can see faces and we can have some conversations. Uh, I don't know if you guys do that, but I'd be open to doing that as well. You know, you bring up a good point. In fact, I want to take this opportunity to apologize to everybody. We just realized three quarters of the way through that our chat was completely disabled. So nobody's been able to chat and that's on us. And, and I guess that will prompt us to see how we could coordinate something where people can chat in video chat and move with the technology because along these, yeah. these lines. Well, what, what, we, what we do is, you know, we let 30, 40 people into the room. We just lay the ground rules. You know, if you got a question, raise your hand. Please don't interrupt people. If you're vulgar or do something bad, we're going to delete you out of the call. Uh, and it is much, it's, we found that when, I, when I'm just talking to a couple of you and then, you know, the camera, I don't get a sense of the audience. They don't, they don't mm -hmm. get a sense they can really ask me a question. You let everybody come on camera and it's just a conversation. And I think what they call is they, you make me, you, you pin me or something like that. So I show up, you know, kind of able to answer questions, but everybody else is there. And it just makes for a, a little bit more of a human experience that we're all craving. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Next, we'll, we'll, we'll work on that. We'll make that a point uh, uh, of contention. So Paris, what else do we have for Jim? I know there's a lot of questions in, in the chat box, as well as uh, you had some questions that were submitted prior to the event. Yes, um, let's try to go through all the life questions first then. Um, so regarding COVID and variants, um, how do you see vaccination proof being used to allow access of individuals into public health events or places? This is where the privacy topic is gonna to get real interesting in the next six months. 
the way I see it is there's a lot of people, Bill Gates, uh, Oracle, others calling for what they call a health certificate. That once you get the vaccine, you're given a digital certificate on your phone. This has actually been going on in China since the beginning of COVID. They call it the, the COVID code. Um, you cannot get into an office building. You can't get into a mall. You can't get into a venue without a code. If your code goes from green to yellow, that means you came in contact possibly with somebody with COVID. Relatively very sophisticated contact tracing system. Has a lot of benefits when it comes to you know, keeping something like a pandemic in check. But you always, in my world, have to consider unintended consequences 12, 24, 30 months down the road. So there's already airlines talking about you can't get on an airplane unless you show your code. You can't get into that concert unless you show that code. I believe there's going to be plenty of civil liberty discussion. At least I hope there are plenty of arguments and discussions about this because you could pretty much say if you're one of those people who don't want to take a vaccine, you could be shut out from daily life as we know it. And I understand how important and bad the pandemic is, but you know the Constitution is, is, is quite an important document. And I'm not sure the founders understood how far technology was going to go. But I think if we're not careful, our civil liberties could be dramatically at stake if we don't think this thing the whole way through. Got it. Um, so you touched on a lot of topics and we have an audience who's a small business owner who would like to know what are the top three things to focus on? So did you say they're a small business owner? Yeah. Okay, so I'm assuming they probably don't have a chief information officer. Um, or, and, and I've, I've done this, this particular talk a uh, thousand times, and I've had that question asked a thousand and one times, okay? It's, it's a very common question. So what I, I, before I tell you what three things I would focus on, here's a suggestion I would have. As a small business operator, you are not, you are not going to be able to keep up with the technology being implemented by the big guys, okay? And you think back to the small five and dime owner of 40 years ago, trying to compete with the Walmarts and the Amazons today, it's a big challenge. That whole thing is gonna come to the real estate industry at some point in time where these big uh, operators are using technology, flatten their processes, have really got a big competitive advantage. So what I suggest to the small owners are band together, find three, four, five, 10 owners of your size, create a little consortium, that way you're all not reinventing the wheel each and every time. You are leveraging each other. You know, you don't have to pay, you know, let's say you're the, the, the cost of putting together a little plan for your company would come cost $100,000. Well, if you don't have $100,000 to spend on it and there's 10 of you who each put in 10,000, you won't get the exact personalized, um, you know, uh, treatment that you would if you had your own consultant, but at least you're not sitting there at three o'clock in the morning doing Google searches on what property management system should I buy for my company? So my number one advice for small companies is, and actually this could be a great opportunity for CCIM to be a conduit to, to come up with a small business owner tech group where you maybe hire a consultant to come in once a month and ask all, you know, let everybody ask a bunch of questions, but going it alone is not an, is not an option. Um, so that's, that's kind of statement number one. Number two would be, um, if you go back to your office and, and it's lined with file cabinets, you better hire somebody because um, Realcom has never have really had a file cabinet in 20 years. CBRE and their whole big you know, digital transformation over the last seven years is getting rid of and gotten rid of um, you know, file cabinets have gone all digital. So you know, if you've got file cabinets that tells me you got a problem and it's time to get some help. And then the last thing I would say is don't just read the magazine and find something that's interesting. Don't uh, listen to what your friend tells you is the must go to technology. You have to put together a plan. And the way I used to do the plans are survey everybody in the company and say, what would they like to make their jobs better and easier? There'll be a hundred responses, get your executive leadership around, get it down to five or seven. You can't do a hundred. There's no way it's called prioritization. And then, you know, you put a dollar amount next to what each thing would cost. Then you prioritize, pick three things um, and, and then do them do them well, probably an architecture, communications architecture is one, then you need your application layer, your property management, your lease administration. And then after that, and kind of in concert with that, you come up with your data strategy. I know that might sound sophisticated and, and confusing, but 
I think my number one piece of advice is hire a consultant, somebody that can help guide you if you don't have in-house expertise. Thank you for that thorough answer. Um, okay, our next question asks, with more analytics being used by borrowers and brokers, how will lenders need to prepare in order to stay up to date? Oh, that's a great question. Um, again, I'm gonna be controversial. Let's imagine you have a brokerage office with 50 brokers doing business the old way. Everybody doing their own searches, keeping their own databases, sometimes sharing information, reinventing the wheel every single deal, no automation, no streamline. That brokerage office of 50 brokers with the right designed five person office with people with good biz dev skills, good, uh, let's call it 10 people, good biz dev, good market, good communication skills, good sales skills. And let's say you put three of those people in with seven analysts, data people, 10 people can do the work of 50 brokers, okay? New model versus old. So that's, that's addressing the, the brokerage side. Now, when those brokers start going to the lenders, um, I, I've been involved with you know, brokerage and building and commercial real estate lending for a long time. There is so much inefficiency, so much lack of coordinated. We saw what happened in 08. It's my humble opinion that some of that CMBS debt it never really got fully resolved from 08. And now we're piling on more and more. And because the information systems are so disconnected um, and, and the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing, we have a potential for a real problem again as it relates to the lending industry. So everybody from brokerage to lender to property manager has to tighten the game. We can't allow for misinformation or lack of information to allow us to make bad decisions anymore. And just like I walked into Mark's office, or Rand's office 30 years ago and said, the market's gonna collapse. If you get your data in control, you, it's like a crystal ball. You can see three, six, nine months in the future um, when most people can't. All right. So um, the next question asks about where does one access information to educate oneself about 5G? Well, here's a little self-promotion. I mean, Realcom has spent 22 years being the educational collaboration community uh, to, um, to learn about technology. We've got a fairly robust um, uh, archive of information about 5G. Um, you can go up to our YouTube channel uh, and there's videos going back three years that still are relevant to some extent. We, on a very regular basis, do webinars on 5G and CBRS and in building wireless. Most of those webinars, if they're already done, are up on the web, able to be accessed. So you can listen to those webinars. Uh, most of those have been turned into podcasts. So you can go up and search for 5G podcasts that we've done. So um, I would say that, you know, as one of the premier real estate technology educators in the world, we might be a good first stop. Um, and then uh, if that uh, doesn't you know, solve the question, have that person send me an email through you and I can put you in touch with a few consultants that might be able to help out um, that, that really know what they're talking about. Sounds good. And um, Jim, can you estimate when the traditional residential MLS will no longer have significant control over available properties for sale? Um, do you see that close in horizon? That battle has been going on for 30 years. <laughs> I, uh, one of my first consults that I ever did as a consultant was with the California Association of Realtors. Uh, me and my partner at the time designed something called Rex, the real estate exchange for the California Association of Realtors. I don't think there's a, a bit of the evidence to be found on the internet of that. It was pre-internet. We took, and because the internet wasn't around yet, we used CompuServe and Parrish, you're probably way, way, way too young to even know what CompuServe is, but it was the internet before the internet with AOL and CompuServe and a couple others were the, you know. but what we did for CAR was we, we took 
the title report and we went, we got three different title agencies. We came up with a little software program that aggregated three different reports and put it um, up on, on the internet, right? And so my point is trying to disintermediate residential MLSs has been literally going on for 30 years. Um, I, I, I see companies like Zillow and others, um, you know, they're coming into the market from the left side. Um, you've got people like Google playing around. Um, and so, you know, if I was a real estate agent today and I, and I was, you know, setting up a practice or a little group inside, you, you'd have to spend a significant amount of time and energy with some good technical expertise to be able to determine what is the best source. I'm actually involved in this challenge right this minute because I'm looking at some property in another part of the country and, and we've got the local MLS and, and you've got um, more public uh, systems like Zillow. And the answer is right now, you got to probably check three or four. And if you know what you're doing, you could you individually can come up with the robust listing set. Um, but the average person who doesn't know data and has to scrounge around, the MLS is probably still the best source uh, that I can tell right now. Okay, so um, what data do you think uh, we should monitor any specific data um, that one should look at as broker yeah, the, or owner? So as a broker or owner, I mean, um, I've always looked at, at data inside the real estate organization. So if you're a brokerage company, the deals, the size of the deal, the cost per square foot, all the typical stuff, right? Um, you know, late time on market, um, and, and, and then, then what I like to do is juxtapose external data. You know, so housing in, in San Diego is going up, okay? Yet uh, I would wanna check the GDP numbers for San Diego. There's 40 million people out of work. Yes, we're relatively tech savvy region. We've got a lot of healthcare workers, but there's still a lot of unemployed people in San Diego. So I would be driving into that, that employment data to see, is there a correlation between you know, unemployment and housing prices? How can houses be going up when people are losing their jobs? And the answer is because people with cash in their pockets are coming from other parts of the country. So now you got to look at, at migration patterns. People are leaving California for a number of reasons. People are coming into California. Now, this seems like an awful lot of work to determine, you know, should I list my, my building or my house or my mall for 10% more? You know, my short answer is just list it for 10% more and see what happens. But, but a good command on data both the traditional real estate data and some external, like I just mentioned, I think is the key to a really successful real estate practice. Here's a, here, I'll give you a short answer real quick. If I was gonna hire somebody to list my office building or my mall, one of my first questions would be, how many quants do you have on staff? Do you know, do you know what a quant is? The, the, it's a nickname for somebody who does quantitative analysis. They, they just crunch numbers. And if, if real estate companies don't have analysts, I call them quants, analysts, that know how to crunch numbers both internally and externally, then I'm probably gonna look for a different brokerage company. Great, I just learned a new word. <laughs> Very cool. Okay, our last question. Um, Jim, could you explain iCloud versus blockchain and why is blockchain the future? Can you say that one more time? Um, could you explain iCloud uh, or cloud technology versus blockchain technology? So you're and, not talking about iCloud as a product, but the cloud is a concept. No, um, I would interpret the question asking cloud as a concept, the okay. cloud technology well, versus that, that was the last technology. screen that I showed, okay? All right, so I've been in tech almost my whole career, tech, real estate tech, and then real estate tech. And I'm gonna give you a history le lesson in computing in about 30 seconds, maybe 60. So the way the world went was uh, the first really substantial computing platform was mainframe computers. They were expensive and by today's standard, they weren't very powerful. Only the Fortune 50 could afford them. They, only the biggest corporations could have big rooms full of computers and the general public was not accessible, did not have access. The next step was mini computers. Those were smaller computers, less expensive. You could put little computers in departments of companies. So all of a sudden you extended the computing power away from just that group of people into the departments. Next major step was PCs, personal computers. All of us got to buy these little boxes and start playing around with uh, 
uh, Excel and PowerPoint and Lotus one, two, three, you know, in our houses. Then all of a sudden um, they became portable computers. And then all of a sudden they became, um, they became uh, connected to this standard network called the internet. And all of a sudden cell phones came along. And then all of a sudden everybody said, I don't want to have my own computers. It's too expensive to maintain. I'm going to the cloud. So ironically, we're right back to mainframe computers. A big computer, the only difference is everybody can use it, not just a select group of people. Oh, and PS, you have a, a really com powerful computer in your hand connecting to this even more powerful computer in the cloud. Because of privacy and data security and cybersecurity and data theft, I don't know if, if you follow the breaches, but I mean, this last one, uh, um, solar winds, if you haven't read about it, hundreds, thousands, millions of confidential people's names, addresses, contacts, relations, intellectual property stolen. So there's a little undercurrent going on right now. And we're usually five, 10 years ahead. But I'm, I'm starting to put my ear to the ground. People are starting to pull away from the cloud. I don't trust Facebook with my data. I don't trust Google with my data. And I'm not saying that's true or not. I'm telling you what people are starting to question. So this, this blockchain, and I don't understand it technically 100% because it's, it's five years old, but it's still new. I think a certain subset, and maybe eventually a lot of people are gonna go back to a distributed environment where they pull the technology back into their house and they say, you know, I want my own email. I don't wanna use Gmail. They read my email, I don't like that. Okay, I, 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 and, and I, there, there is a early signs that we might be seeing a little backlash from centralized to distributed, from centralized to distributed. I think we might see a little, uh, a little pushback to dis decentralize. Way too early to tell, but to ever ask the question, a good question, I would keep an eye on it. Well, thank you, Jim. I believe that's a wrap for the Q&A session. Um, thanks for staying on so long with us. My Back pleasure. To you guys. All right, well, guys, as you can see, we're coming out of the Hopper for 2021 with a strong lunch and learn series with CCIM San Diego. Jim, a big thank you. This was all very incredible information and we're all sitting here blown away by what the future holds for commercial real estate. And we're really grateful to have you here, especially the fact that you took a little bit longer and stayed longer. Uh, just so everybody knows, this was recorded. Uh, Jim covered an incredible amount of information uh, so you will be receiving a link to the recording, which will show up in your email. Also, I believe we're going to be including Jim's not uh, information for Realcom and for his company. If you want to learn more about uh, how you might be able to participate with them. And again, be on the lookout for our next event for the month of February. Check into CCIMSanDiego.com. Go and follow our LinkedIn page, as well as check out uh, all of our topics, which we post on the web on YouTube. Uh, we're continually trying to bring you great content and with Jim's presentation, we now have set the bar very high. So Paris, you and I better start looking for uh, what other speakers, what other content we can bring uh, because Jim, you've done an excellent job. So thank you so much, Jim. Thank you. And uh, any final words or final thoughts you'd like yeah, to share? I mean, San Diego is my hometown and you know, you always have a little personal connection to your hometown. So anything I can do to help, you know, um, let me know. And uh, I I'm here to, to help uh, if needed. Wonderful. Well, we're very grateful for that. And on behalf of CCIM San Diego, uh, Paris Moore, uh, Mo, Doug Tabor, have a safe and well uh, 2021. And we look forward to seeing you again. Be well, thrive.